You know what? This episode is a long time coming. I've been promising a piece about watering for the longest time now, but I've been pushing it back. This is going to be a very long episode, so sit back, relax, make yourself comfortable as the intro plays. Watering. It's a topic that sounds simple in theory, but it's a cause of confusion and stress for some. It should be a relaxing activity, think of it as bonding time with your plants. But it's hard to think that way when a lot of your plants are dying from underwatering and more often than not, overwatering and rot. If you look around online, especially in groups, you'll always see questions about this topic. So what better way to do this than in an FAQ format? When should I water next? Personally, I just play it by the ear. Many experienced succulent growers would tell you to wait until the soil is completely dry before watering again. And there's a lot, there's lots of other channels talking about this, so I'll refer, I'll refer you to one of them. A good one would be this video from Succulent Fame, which she published last week. So have a look at that. I keep hearing about deep soaking the soil. What does that mean? Essentially, this is where you ensure that the soil around the roots are wet or soaked. Many experienced growers would share their techniques on this and like I said earlier, here's a video from Succulent Fame. You might want to refer to that. But if you're like me and you have your plants in the ground, it takes a while and many tries before it just becomes something you could feel or something you could just verify visually, you know, without having to check if the soil is still wet. But all I could say is, Go crazy with your watering. If you're unsure of the amount of water, add more. Hey, didn't you just say not to overwater your plants? Yes, I did. But remember, overwatering does not refer to a single session. I am referring to the total amount of water that you would give it as well as the frequency of your watering. So it's a function of watering over time. But why do we have to deeply soak them? Why not just give them a bit of water every day, like a slow drip? Well. Think of it this way, if a plant has easy access to water, then it won't work hard for it. It won't work hard to find it. What this essentially means is that the roots would be shallow and underdeveloped because they won't have to go far to find water. Also, if a plant is constantly sitting in damp or wet soil, that greatly increases the risk of fungus growing. As, as I mentioned in the previous episode, fungus thrives in moist and humid environments and that would lead to rot. Or if you're lucky enough to not have any fungus attacking your plants, then the plant would be taking in too much water and they would end up bursting in their leaves. So either way, you would not want the plants to have too much water and exposing them to water every single day is just begging for it, you know? I'm pretty sure you've seen lithops do that. If you wait for the soil to drain and to sufficiently dry, then the plant will be looking further for water. That means they will have to extend their roots, spread their roots even further away from the plant. And for best results, they will have to cover more area that would greatly increase their chance of finding water. And in doing so, grabbing over a larger area means that they would be more stable, better rooted in the soil. And a well-draining soil with lots of roots around means that there's going to be lots of air pockets. Air pockets. Why do we need that? Well, assuming your soil is porous enough and drains really well, then having air pockets around the roots in the soil means that there's it would be e a lot easier for the roots to move around. And of course, mechanically, it means that water will just be passing through. It's a lot easier for it to drain. It's a lot easier to get air pockets if you have a gritty enough soil. So this is more of a discussion about your soil mix. This is not in the scope of this video, so we might speak about this some other time. What time of day should I water? Is it better to water in the morning rather than night? This is a very loaded question, a very hotly debated topic online. I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. And before I give my answer, let me discuss photosynthesis and plant respiration first. Okay, what does knowing about photosynthesis and respiration have anything to do about watering? Well, I'm sorry, there's no other way around this. I would have to be technical, so bear with me. A lot of succulents are classified in a category called CAM plants, and CAM stands for Crassulaceae Acid Metabolism. 
and this is also known as Camp Photosynthesis. Yes, it is named after the family Crassulaceae, but there are also lots of other plants outside of this family that can do Camp Photosynthesis. A good example would be the Cactaceae. It got its name because it was first discovered in a group of plants under the Crassulaceae family. So, yeah. And if you're not familiar with that family, the Crassulaceae family contains genera such as Aeonium, Echeveria, Crassula, Sedums, and a lot, lot more. If we look up CAM in Wikipedia, we get Crassulaceae acid metabolism, also known as CAM photosynthesis. It's a carbon fixation pathway that evolved in some plants as an adaptation to arid conditions. In a plant using full CAM, the stomata in the leaves remain shut during the day to reduce evapotranspiration, but open at night to collect carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is stored as a 4-carbon acid mallet in vacuoles at night, and then in the daytime, the mallet is transported to chloroplast where it is converted back to carbon dioxide, which is then used during photosynthesis. The pre-collected carbon dioxide is concentrated around the enzyme ribulose biphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, increasing photosynthetic efficiency. But what does that even mean? Let's go back to what we learned in school. Animals need food to gain energy. Green plants and algae do not need to eat food because they make their own food in a process called photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, the plant takes in carbon dioxide, water, and light, an energy source, and converts this into glucose and oxygen. The oxygen is released into the environment while the glucose is stored in the plant. The plant uses glucose as energy or store them for later use. <gasps> plant cells respire just as animals do. If they stop respiring, they will die. Don't confuse respiring with breathing. They are not the same thing. Plants do not breathe. During respiration, plants take glucose and oxygen, and after chemical reaction, produce energy. This also results also in two waste products, carbon dioxide and water. <gasps> Animals remove carbon dioxide in their bodies by breathing out while plants release carbon dioxide at night. So let's do a recap. In photosynthesis, plants take in carbon dioxide, water, and some light. Light as a form of energy. And in turn, they produce glucose, a simple sugar, their own food, and oxygen. The reverse happens in respiration. What the plant does is it takes in the glucose, the food source, along with some oxygen. And the result of this would be energy after breaking down glucose and with the waste products of carbon dioxide and water. Plants respire all the time. Day or night, doesn't matter, they do it round the clock. But they can only perform photosynthesis under the presence of light. So as you would imagine in dark conditions, such as night, only respiration is happening, which means that they're producing lots of carbon dioxide and water. And the net result is that oxygen is being taken in and carbon dioxide is being given out. Now moving on to dim light or a place where in the shade basically, this probably even applies indoors. So under dim light, there would be a bit of photosynthesis happening, photosynthesis and respiration. So if you recall, in photosynthesis, they take in carbon dioxide and water to produce oxygen and glucose. But at the same time, respiration also happens. So it takes that oxygen and glucose that it produces during photosynthesis and uses that immediately in respiration. What happens here is that the photosynthesis rate is roughly equal to the respiration rate, which means that there's no net production of oxygen or carbon dioxide because the plant uses up whatever it produces, you know? There's no net change overall. And I imagine this is what's happening indoors if, or if you have plants in the shade underneath something. And finally, bright light, that's when you have plants exposed to sunlight or maybe filtered light. And maybe even grow lights if you have them indoors. So what happens here is that the photosynthesis rate is higher than the respiration rate, which means that more oxygen and glucose is being used compared to the amount that's being consumed during respiration. So the net result here is that the plant is producing oxygen since all of the carbon dioxide that it produces goes back into photosynthesis. Another thing you must know is that when the photosynthesis rate is higher than respiration, the plants produce so much glucose that they have to store it in the plant. In summer, plants have access to a lot more light compared to the rest of the year. And this allows them to produce so much glucose that it would last them throughout winter and to fuel the new growth during spring. Now, wait a minute. You keep mentioning indoor plants and that indoor plants is basically having dim light which means that the photosynthesis rate is roughly equal to respiration rate. You know how people claim that some indoor plants purify air? Is there any truth to that? You know what? I don't really know. There's no way to tell because it's hard to tell how much light is enough to overcome respiration, you know? That might require something more scientific, a bit more measurement, I guess. 
something I cannot do myself? Consider this to be my shower thought. If indoor plants do not produce more oxygen than they consume, then how are they purifying the air indoors? I imagine that when people say purify the air, they mean that the plant takes in carbon dioxide, because of course carbon dioxide is toxic to humans, and converts it into oxygen. But if the plant is not able to do enough photosynthesis to offset the loss of oxygen, then are you doing more harm than good? I don't know. I don't have a way to measure this, so yeah, it's just something that I've been thinking about. You know what, this got me thinking, should plants be given more light? Maybe this is the reason why people are being told to rotate the plants, you know, give them some time outdoors before putting them back in. Maybe rotate them once a week or something. Because of course you'll notice this indoors. If a plant stays indoors for too long, especially in a very dark spot, such as your windowless bathroom, then the plant would not look so good after a while. But moving it out, even just, even just in your living room or in your kitchen where there's still a bit of light they seem to be they seem to do a bit better and probably it also depends on the type of plant we're talking about because some plants seem to have a lower threshold of light you know which means that they probably use a lot less carbon dioxide in respiration and they require a lot less light to be able to photosynthesize efficiently so, again that's lots of questions in my mind and i'm not sure how to answer that yet and so far, we've discussed normal plants. Let's go back to camp. With camp plants, it's a bit different. These plants usually grow in arid locations where it's dry and usually too hot, which means that there's not a lot of water to go around. And any water that they have when they respire quickly evaporates into the environment. So they have to work on a mechanism that would allow them to retain as much water to be more efficient with their water use. So camp plants have evolved to adapt to this. In the leaves of the plant, there are these things called stomata. These are the little openings, the pores, the leaves where uh, gas exchange, the carbon dioxide gets released. So normally plants have this open during the day. And while these are open, lots of water will be evaporating, which means that leaves are losing a lot of water. In fact, based on research that I made, non camp plants lose up to 97% of water just by this action evaporating during the day but this is not usually a problem for them especially if they are living in the tropics or somewhere more humid where water is more readily available but in arid locations where water is really scarce this is no good so what camp plants have evolved to do is to keep the stomata shut during the day and only open it at night so what they do is to open up at night gather all of the carbon dioxide that they need, store it within the plant so that they could use it the next day, during the morning, during the day, when they are starting to do photosynthesis. Basically, it's a delayed process. They store during the night so that they could use it during the day. It's a pretty smart adaptation, pretty efficient adaptation, and you know, it's impressive. So essentially what I'm saying is, camp plants are very efficient with their use of water. They do not waste them unnecessarily. Now imagine moving a camp plant from an arid location to a very wet, very humid location which means that now it's getting a lot more water than it needs and since it has adapted not to use lots of water so if you give it a lot more water than it needs it will try to store all of this water within the plant wherever until it can't take water much more and it just ends up bursting so I'm sure you've seen this in lithops and probably other plants too and of course assuming they haven't rotten due to fungus yet and this my friends is why everyone tells you not to overwater your succulent plants they are not built for that so when to water realistically and practically speaking you may water any time of day that it suits you provided that it's not too hot and i say that not because i'm afraid that you would burn your leaves Due to the droplets no that's a myth but mainly because it's so damn uncomfortable being out under the scorching sun you know i think it's stupid you should look out for yourself man besides most of the water that you spray on the plants would be evaporating under the sun anyway so you're just wasting water personally i prefer late in the afternoon or early evening and this is mainly because i'm not a morning person i hate getting up so early wasting some of that precious sleep time sleep hours 
just to water my plants. A lot of people would tell you that watering in the morning has the advantage in that excess moisture would be evaporated by the sun during the day. And there's also this myth going around that drenching a soil during a very hot day would burn the roots. I used to believe this because it sounds really plausible, but in reality there's not enough heat to cook the plants, especially if you have a well-draining soil and if you mulch or cover the soil. Your soil or the top layer of the soil ends up having lots of air pockets and air is a very poor conductor of heat. So you do not have to worry about drenching your soil while it's hot outside. You only avoid watering during hot days just so you don't burn yourself or get dehydrated or you know, skin cancer. Take care of yourself. Watering in the evening is a lot more comfortable but the lack of evaporation means that the plants and the soil would be staying wet a lot longer than if you watered in the morning. But it's going to be less of an issue if you're the type who lets the soil dry completely between watering, which means a lot of the water that you just gave the plant and the soil would be quickly taken up by all of the plants since they are deprived of water. And if you have your soil done properly, then the excess would be running, out, running off anyway. The only thing you have to worry about when watering is Fusarium it is a genus of fungus. It is a deadly fungus that thrives in warm, humid environments. So this is something that you would likely encounter during summer. Not so much when it's colder. In fact, I haven't had any rot while it is colder. I tend to have more plants rotting when it's summer. Go figure. And again, like I said in the previous episode, this is going to be less of a problem, the fusarium. If you have your garden well ventilated, the soil, the plants, underneath the plants, and if you maintain a good garden hygiene, so clean all of those dead leaves, remove the detritus, make sure that there would be nothing that would create excess, unnecessary humidity, no, no extra moisture to retain. You can do that by cleaning up, by cleaning up your garden. Just keep everything well ventilated and tidy. How come it doesn't matter what time I water them then? Remember the deep soak technique? Like I said earlier, by the time that you water them again, your plants would be so thirsty that they would be drinking water like a fish. And you'll notice that especially in growing season, it takes just a few days, maybe, maybe even just a day, before the soil seems to be completely dry again. You would definitely notice this when plants are actively growing. So in short, what I'm saying is, monitor your soil's moisture. Does watering overhead scorch leaves? No. In reality, if it's hot enough, then the, the water would evaporate long before they would have any chance of burning the leaves. Instead, what you have to do is to be a lot more careful about the abrasiveness of your spray, of your jet of water, and make sure that you do not unnecessarily rub off the farina of the plants because this is their protection against burns. Does overhead watering cause plants to rot? No unless your place has poor ventilation or is very filthy. So tidy up your place. Basically what I'm saying is if you create an environment that's good for fungus, then it will rot. But if you do not create an ideal place for fungus, then you have nothing to worry about. But if you're too concerned about this, then there's a few mechanical techniques that you could do. First of which is if you're planting in the ground, plant them at a slight angle. That way excess water would be forced to fall off the leaves or if they are in pots, just tilt the pot slightly. I personally think that trying to avoid watering overhead is a waste of time, especially if you have to resort to using various tools just to avoid the leaves. There's a lot of manipulation involved and I have lots of plants. There's no time for me to do that. I think you should rather spend all of that energy creating a clean environment, removing the dead leaves and just giving your plants a proper ventilation. So do not keep them in some place where the air would just be stale, you know? I would prefer a windy location. And worst case, if they are inside the room, you could always just turn on the fan, just blow the fan on them. Just give them something, man. How often should I water? Well, the first thing I would say is sticking to a schedule is not a good idea because the needs of the plant changes throughout the year, especially if you live in a climate where you have the four seasons. And I say this because in temperate climates, the growing and the dormant season would be a lot more distinct. But even so, if you live in the tropics where there's 
very little variance throughout the year, there's still going to be a dormant season for the plants when it gets too hot. And plants have very different watering requirements when it's dormant versus when it's growing. So you have to be very mindful of that. Plants would not need much water when they are dormant, but they would need a lot more water when they are actively growing. So you have to be very mindful of that. My plants are wilting. Should I water? Well, wilting is a sign that the leaves or the stem is not getting enough water, but it does not necessarily mean that you would need to water them. Make sure to check your plants, the stems of your plants, and see if there's any rot or any breakage because that would prevent water and nutrients from flowing properly into the rest of the plant. Rotting can prevent the flow of water and nutrients to some parts of the plant, so that's one of the things that you should check for when you see that your plants are wilting. Don't immediately assume that you need to water them because you're going to do a lot more harm if you do so. So what can you do about this? So say you have a wilting plant and it seems like there's no rotting or no broken parts anywhere, then try watering it for a day and see how it responds over the, ne over the next few days. If it responds favorably, then you're lucky, it was just dehydrated. But if not, then you'll have to check the roots this time, see if there's any damage or broken roots or broken stem. There might be something underneath that you're not seeing. So, yeah. Should I fill the bottom of the pots to improve drainage? You know what, this myth has been busted so many times already and it still seems to be pervasive. I'll put a link down below in the description showing explaining how this is a myth and how you should avoid doing this. But to summarize, water does not quickly flow through different layers, different densities. It would have to saturate the, the first layer first before it moves on to the next. It's the same as having a sponge of water and placing it on top of rocks, I guess. It would have to saturate the soil layer first before it gets and before it trickles down into the pebbles. Let's take this one for example. If you have to if you're thinking of adding pebbles this high, what this means is that you're reducing the amount of soil that you have in this pot, giving less depth for the soil. Rather than having the soil occupy the entire stretch of the pot, you're only having a soil this way. This means that the soil has to oversaturate with water first and there's lots of water being stored here rather than going down here, which means that a lot of water would be pulling around the roots of the plant. And like I said, it would be staying wet longer and there's a higher likelihood of rot if fungus sets in. It just rained. I don't need the water anymore, right? Well, it depends on what type of rain we're talking about. If you had enough rainfall, then I guess you could treat it as a watering session and you could wait for the next time the soil drains and completely, completely dries out. But if you only had a light shower, then what I would usually do is to go out the next day or go out as soon as it is done and finish off what the rain started. I will water my plants, make sure they, they soak deeply and you know, just restart my watering cycle. Or not, I'm lazy most of the time. Are there any other special tricks to mention? Yes, I might still have a couple to share. The first one would be to make use of the weather, weather forecast to see if there's going to be any rain or whatever. This is going to help you decide whether you need to water now or hold off for a few days. And finally, if you haven't noticed it, one of the undertones that I'm trying to subtly tell you here in this episode is that you should make sure that you have proper soil mix that is properly draining because a lot of these problems would go away if you have if you do your soil properly and of course you would also need ventilation so make sure you have a properly ventilated area and a well draining soil and you'll be fine and that's it for my long rant was it a rant it felt like a rant but yeah that's it for my episode on watering. I hope you learned a lot and enjoyed what I had to share with you. I also hope that I got you to think about your watering regimen and be more mindful about you know, the, the needs of your plant. In the end, I do not want you to stress too much about your plants, but at least if you're going to stress, I would like you to be better informed. You know? That way you only have to stress about the important things and not the unnecessary stuff that's out of your control. In the next episode, I'm thinking about touching on the differences between dormant and actively growing plants since that's one of the things that uh, trips people in terms of watering. 
because I've seen lots of people watering a plant not knowing it was dormant and the plant died. So I think that would be a good topic for the next episode. So I'll see you then. Bye. Special thanks to all of my Patreon supporters, especially Oscarino, Judy Seal, Snap Kui, Gloria Ninotti, Kamil Arvaez, Linda Leal, Gwen Ott, Q2, Jesse May, and Ronin Perez. Thank you so much. Without your help, a lot of this is not possible. You should also check out my website, seriescafes.com. I have a plant shop and Seriscapedia section right there. I push updates once in a while, so make sure to check back from time to time. And finally, follow me on Instagram, that's at Seriescapades. I post a photo of an Echeveria every single day under the hashtag DailyEchevera.